you've been like in and out um, at all during kind of especially the last six or five or six weeks, um, you'll have a little bit harder time grasping kind of uh, some of what I say tonight. So I encourage you if you can, and if you've missed some of these um, teachings from Matthew 5 to Matthew 7, go back and watch the podcast. That's one of the reasons we do it, so we can have something to refer back to. Um, but uh, but I'll try to be clear, even if you haven't um, haven't been here for that. Um, I I wanted to just begin by saying that as a um, as a pastor of this small church, um, if there's ever been a time to to listen, which I hope that you listen when you come on every Wednesday night, but I would just really plead with you to listen closely tonight. Um, and I say that because I, I know you all, and I love you all, and, I, and it's not just that I feel like brotherly love for you, which I do, but, um, but I feel like I, I need to love you well by um, speaking boldly some difficult, kind of blatant truths that Jesus speaks in, in Matthew 7. And I don't want to shy away from it. So we're like, a, I think we're a fun group, and we like to have fun and joke around. But tonight um, is rather, it's a very serious message. And um, you know, the Bible isn't meant just to just to help us through this life, which it does. Um, but it makes promises about the future, very important. Um, it gives very important information about the future. And again, kind of as as a leader of this church. I don't want any of you to be fooled by, um, or to be fooled about what lies in store for eternity. Um, and I think, I, I like what Paul tells the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians, he says, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith, test yourselves. And so I would say tonight, um, this, this is a message for all of us, it's a good, um, message that we can uh, listen to and, and really examine ourselves, e each one of us. Like, Adam, this is for you, and Shana for you, and Randy, and um, Alicia. Dude, like, this th this isn't just for people who are deciding whether or not they're interested in the kingdom of heaven. I think this is for all of us, and I would urge you to say, hey, examine your lives and see if, see if this is you. Um, and that'll make a little more sense as we go along. But we've been talking about living for the kingdom. By the way, we'll be in Matthew 7, uh, starting in verse 13 tonight and to the end of the chapter. Um, we've been talking about the kingdom of heaven, which is very different, we've been seeing, than the, the kingdom of this world. In many ways, it's, it's almost opposite, or at least it's very distinct from a lot of the mindsets of this world. So we've seen things like, blessed or happy are the poor, which it's like, well, that's different than what, you, what you'd expect in the world. Happy, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are persecuted and reviled. Some of these things, well, that's different than what the world would think. Um, we're told to stand out as salt and light in this world, which is distinct from the world. It's different. Um, we're told, we've seen that it doesn't just, we don't just need to do the right things outwardly, which is like religion in this world. It's just make sure that you do these things. But Jesus cares about what's going on inwardly. He cares about our heart. Um, the world kind of says, hey, get, get your praise now and make a name for yourself and be recognized and followers of Jesus uh, living for his kingdom. Uh, we learned a couple weeks ago, do even the right things in secret. Like that shows kind of the, the evidence of a heart that, um, that understands the kingdom of God. And so tonight, the, the, this is the end of this Sermon on the Mount that we've spent six weeks in. And Jesus draws some like really clear lines between those who will at a future time enter the kingdom and those who will not enter the kingdom. And it's really like black and white. And by black and white, I don't mean it's black and white where I can look at everybody and see, oh, well, I know for sure you're going to enter the kingdom, and I know for sure you're not going to enter the kingdom, whatever. That's not, I say it's black and white, meaning there's just two options. Like, either you will be in the kingdom of heaven, or you won't be in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus spells that out in four different ways uh, that Matthew records here. And so... Um, My fear tonight, if, you, if you've been a Christian for a long time, is that you'll, 
you'll immediately put yourself in the category and make assumptions. Well, yes, I'm, I'm a part of the kingdom of heaven, or that's the, the kingdom that I'm gonna, that I will enter one day, and think, well, I'm okay, I'm on, I'm on the good side, I don't really need to listen, but I wanna ask you again, please, please, like pay attention and listen to the nuance, because what Jesus says here with a couple of these is some people who actually think, oh yeah, that's, that's gonna be me, I'm gonna stand before the Lord and I should have entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Some people who think that, Christians that we know, hope, I, I hope not us, but think that they're going to be that person when they're actually not, and they've been deceived. They've deceived themselves. And so, um, so please examine uh, yourselves, I, I'd say, as we go through this. And in fact, I just want to pray that, that God would do that. Lord, would you help us to just search uh, what's going on in our own hearts and where we, uh, where we stand before you and Lord, we want our, our lives to line up with, with your will and not our own created version of what we think your will is, but what your actual will for our life and our belief and our heart is. So God, would you help us to know and, and, and discern and see what's, uh, what's true about our lives mm -hmm. uh, in regards to the kingdom of heaven. Pray, please, Lord, amen. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's let's start Matthew seven thirteen. Somebody could just read those first two verses, Matthew seven thirteen and fourteen. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Okay, so let me ask you guys this. I asked Mary Beth this a couple days ago. When you, like, maybe you've, I'm sure many of you have, like, you've heard this this statement before, and so when, like, maybe you even grew up in Sunday school or whatever, and you heard, you kind of had a, a picture of this in your mind. Like, if you, if you had to describe just from what comes to your mind, like, what's the illustration of this that you see in your mind? Like, what's, is there weeds along the path? Like, just be descriptive and kind of what, what you're, what your mind's eye kind of sees and that what's it look like, the gate and the path and that sort of thing. It can be silly, like there's a rabbit or there's, I don't know, what, whatever it is. <laughs> this verse came to mind New Year's Eve in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. you know, people are on the strip and it's just crowded and it's just like thousands and thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And I always think of this verse, the way is broad and it's easy and there's many. Yeah. It's, it always comes to mind when yeah. I see this crowds like that. Yeah. When I think of the narrow, when I think of the narrow um, road, I, I picture like a desert with just like a road kind of like leading. It looks like it's just kind of open and there's no one on it. You're kind of just wandering, hoping that you find your way. Somewhere. Yeah. Okay. I think of like a, in the forest, like a really off beaten path. Like it's kind of just like this, this weird, like I'm kind of seeing a path, but it's just kind of curvy and I'm not exactly sure, you know, uh, versus like the road, which is like clear and like it's yeah. wide and paved it's easy or almost. to, yeah, it's paved, it's just easy to go down and I know where it's leading. Seeing um, um, hiking in private school, it was like a little trail to go up yeah. and it was a bunch of kids kind of clowning around and was, I was like literally trying to get away from them because they were, they were trying to move and um, taking that, that that little path up, but it was literally like up a mountain versus zero going down around and very smooth down. Yeah. So I kind of imagine that. Yeah. Where's the gate in your mind? Like, what's the gate look like? Is it a big gold gate or is it a... I think it's a gold gate. Yeah. 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 And, and is it... With cartoons. Where is it? Like, <laughs> is it at the end of the road or is it the beginning of the road? or the end of the road. Anybody else like? I picture also a bridge, like there's a wide bridge, and then there's yeah, a very I have a bridge narrow, in my mind too. Yeah, it's a very narrow bridge, mm -hmm. and trying to keep your balance on that bridge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um. I I always picture like you, Evangeline, the. Uh, I, my, I think my road or my the ways or the paths are similar to what Mary Beth and Jessica maybe are saying, um, and and I've always pictured the gate or, or the two different gate options. One leads to one gate, and one leads to another, 
kind of at the end of the road, like right before eternity, and you step through that, and then you're in eternity, heaven or hell. And um, I, I think that you can take you can take this passage either way, but uh, the more that I look into it, it, it seems as though there's a, a gate that we're called to enter, and it leads to a road, and at the end of the road is a destination of destruction or, or life. So I, I don't know that that's the case, and you can read people who can say both, um, but I think that's actually what Mary Beth kind of had pictured, is, oh, there's a gate that you walk through, and that leads, that's, that's the entrance to a path, and that's, uh, and at the end of the path, maybe you can see it, or maybe you can't see it, but that's um, eternity. So. Um, so maybe picture it this way: there's there's a um, there's a wide gate, whatever that looks like in your mind. There's an easy way, is what um, the ESV says, but the, it's a wide gate, an easy way that a lot of people are taking. And the end of it, probably you can't see, but the end of it is destruction. We'll talk about it in a second. Then there's a narrow gate, and there's a um, it's it's not necessarily a narrow path, but it's a hard path. Is kind of the idea of that. Uh, word and at the end of that, there's something waiting that that uh, Jesus calls life. So, um, <coughs> destruction. He says this this wide gate and this easy path it leads to destruction that many people are headed toward. And by destruction, I think that. Uh, it, it, it's not just talking about, oh, you, it leads to some bad things in your life, like you're, you're ruining your life, and because um, actually it's, it's an easy way, like your, your way might even, if you, if you choose that gate, your way actually might be somewhat easier in some ways, but the, in, the, in the far distance, or what seems like the far distance, is destruction, and that's destruction, like talking about destruction after this life, specifically, because we're going to see it, it parallels in, in three other illustrations, things like a tree that's thrown into the fire. That's an idea of something eternally that's happening in hell. Uh, it's the, a picture of Jesus saying, hey, you can't be near me. Depart from me, I didn't know you. And departure from the presence of God is, is destruction or is hell. It's what the kind of parallel is. Uh, there's, there's, it's a great fall, it's called, uh, in the last illustration we'll get to. Uh, but Jesus' point in this is th those are the, the two destinations, and the overall point is enter by the narrow gate. It's a hard way. It leads to life. That's uh, overall. We got that. That's that's um, not difficult. Or it, maybe it's take this path that enters through a narrow gate um, that ends up in life. And that's the that's what Jesus is saying. Here's what here's what you need to do. So a little more detail on that. Um, I said there's at the beginning there's two options in these things. It's very black and white. There's the hard way and the easy way. The hard way, that hard word, like it's it's oftentimes um, translated uh, not just hard or difficult, but but troubled or a, a way that experiences tribulation or affliction. Like oftentimes that word hard is translated mostly affliction. Um, and it's this idea of being pressed in against or being worn down. So if you can just picture like that hard path, this narrow gate and the hard path that it leads to, if you can just picture what some of that hard path looks like, it probably looks like some things that Jesus has already mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount that I've already mentioned in this. Those, it, it's people who are poor in spirit who mourn, who are reviled and persecuted, and all kinds of evil is uttered against them. And people who, when slapped on the cheek, they don't, they're not able to take, they don't take revenge, but they turn the other cheek. And people who, when they're sued, they actually say, oh, maybe, maybe I can give you more than you're suing for, but it's a hard way of life. It's not, there's, there's nothing easy about it. And if you remember our study uh, in First Peter, if you're with us for that, you know we talked a lot about that, like this this life that Jesus uh, calls us to, that Peter was calling us to, I think Matthew calls us to, the writers of Scripture and God, um, they call us to a way that that includes suffering and trial and persecution in this life, and which couldn't be surprised when that comes. Peter was saying because that's the same thing that happened to Christ. So why should we expect it would be any different for us? if we're living, if we're following him, following his example. So that's the hard way. Then there's the easy way, or this, this broad entrance into the easy way, which Jesus hasn't talked a lot about what that would look like in the Sermon on the Mount, but maybe it's like the, uh, some of the opposite of that. Maybe it's people who just get to laugh all the time, 
Maybe it's people who are easily accepted by other people. It's people that get the good feeling in this life of taking revenge when, when it's due to somebody. Like people get that. Or maybe uh, that, that easy way is, oh, I, I get to divorce a spouse or I get, to, um, I get to look at pornography. I get to just do whatever I want. That's, that's the easy way. Or I get to pick up the praise of men we talked about. Like that's, that's, what, that's what we go for here. I get to live now to enjoy my money. That's the easy way. And what's going on here is we have, we have these two options. There's a hard way and it's an easy way. And if you're, if you're just thinking about entering that, that narrow gate of the kingdom of heaven, then I think you have to know, hey, that's going to be a hard way. And, uh, or maybe I think most of us are saying, hey, we, we believe that that's the way that we're already on. And so because of that, I think we can take Jesus for his word that it will continue to be a hard way. Like That's what we... Um, have to expect there's um, so-called Christians that, that are going to try to teach that they're and, and uh, some, some are Christians, I don't want to doubt their faith, but are going to teach that, that God's goal for us in this life is that we'd have material success and comfort and the absence of pain and suffering and some of the things that he's already described is going to happen to the true, the follower of Jesus Christ and that's not I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. I don't think that's what we saw in the book of First Peter. So if you have just those two options, this hard way and this easy way, if that's the only choice before you, then why in the world would we choose the hard way? Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is because we read that the hard way, it leads to life. That narrow gate, hard way, few people take it, it leads to life. The easy way leads to destruction. So if we didn't have that destination, like if, if the destination wasn't in play, then I would probably be sitting here telling you, hey, take the easy way, because it's gonna, it might just be a more enjoyable, simple, easygoing life. And if it's if it's a YOLO type situation, then just you know go for it. Yes, I. When you say life, you mean after life, right? Like in heaven? Um, that's a it's a great question. I should clarify because I'm talking kind of back and forth between the two. So uh, if if this life here now, your current life is the only life that we have, and there's nothing to come afterwards, I'm saying, hey, let's let's take whatever the easiest path is, whatever's the most friendly, enjoyable path. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'll try to be better in clarifying which which one I'm talking about, which um, which side of uh, life. Um, but Jesus is teaching that these different ways lead somewhere in the next life or after our death or after Christ's return. They lead somewhere. And because of that, now, now we have something else to consider besides two paths, but we have life and destruction to consider as, as the two longer term possibilities. We're going to talk a lot more about that later in the book of Matthew and then throughout the book of Matthew, and we'll talk about it a little bit tonight. But I, the question may come up, well, why not, and, and maybe you've heard people say this, like, why not just decide, I'm just going to choose the easy way now and, and, and trade that for, I, I don't, I'm not going to care about what comes later after my death. Um, I, I'm just going to choose, like, if, if it's just, well, there's a good thing that I could end up in or there's a good thing that I can have now, so I'm just going to choose the one now. Like, like why not do that? So I, I think... Let's, let's make some comparisons between the two. The, the life that Jesus is saying this one hard path leads to, he's talking about eternal life, life after death. An eternal life in the kingdom of heaven, as we look down it's, and in this whole sermon and collection of, of Jesus' teachings, it's, it, it's, he's talking about eternal life here. And so compare for just a second, like, what do, what do we know about heaven? Just briefly, like, obvious answers, like, what do we know about heaven? Pearly gates. Okay, the pearly... God's there. Yeah, so, okay, God's God's presence uh, is certainly in heaven, yeah. Angels what? and um, trumpets and celebrations. <laughs> okay, yeah, celebration may be a good way to, like, describe all that's going on there, okay, and, and pro not, like, small-scale stuff, like, yeah, let's have some tea, but, like, there's some big stuff described, like, the party... Wedding banquet stuff. What else? Like heaven. No more pain, no more sorrow. Yeah, like the absence of sin and and suffering and all of that stuff. Okay. 
The rocks and the beach are skills and sea is sprite. Really? That's all there is in that. That's a little. Oh, that's, that's not my head. I'm milk dead. Skittles and sprite. So, yeah. It, and so, I think it would be reasonable to say, like, if we look at what scripture, there's, there's other things that we can say about what heaven is like. But it would be reasonable to say, if we look at, at the the goodness or the enjoyment or the blessing of heaven, namely being with God forever versus the enjoyment of the easy way that that we have the option of going down in this earth. Like, they really don't compare. I mean, we can have some good things in this life and enjoy some things, but in comparison to not having any pain or sickness or sorrow and being in the presence of God and knowing Him more fully and being in perfect relationship with each other and with Him, like, there's, it doesn't even compare, right? Mm-hmm. So if we're comparing, well, should I just go for the easy path now and just trade it in and so not, and not take the life later? It, it doesn't make any sense to say, well, I'm just going to choose the easy way. Um, we've talked a little bit about how a, a follower of Christ our pleasures are a little bit postponed, right? We said um, uh, uh, we're not to go for for the praise of man. That's something that we can have right now. Um, but instead, um, we we are waiting for the greater reward of the Father. Like we believe is so much better and more rewarding and important than the praise of men. Um, we're not to lay up treasures for ourselves on earth, but we're we're storing up a much a greater treasure in heaven. So, our, as a follower of Christ, our our um, pleasures and our delights are postponed. Now, you might think uh, that sounds it's a long way away. Like I have no idea when that destination, when I arrive at that destination. I'm 34, and uh, so maybe if I'm fortunate, maybe I have 70 years of this hard path until I get there. Or maybe you have 50 years, or maybe you have 20 years, or maybe you have another few minutes because something's gonna, you don't know how long it's gonna be, but it might seem like in in most, hopefully in most cases in our lives, we have still some years ahead of us. But again, let's like, let's make a comparison. Like compared to what, when we arrive at either life, eternal life, or I gave that answer away, or destruction, the length of that time is forever, right? So what it boils down to, we can we can take this relatively short, hard way, I want to try to be consistent which way I point, this relatively short, hard way that leads to life eternal, abundant, everlasting, or we can take this relatively short, easy way, which leads to life of of, of everlasting destruction and hell, okay? So it's like, when you compare it in that way, it makes sense that Jesus is saying, hey, enter enter the narrow gate. Like, it's not, uh, yes, there's a hard path to come. You're going to enter this gate, and for a time, you're going to travel through this hard path, but you're going to arrive at life forever. So enter the narrow gate. Now, It's, it's clear here, and I think we don't, I don't think about this, um, this reality often enough, but uh, another thing to consider in this, we're spending the most amount of time in this first couple of verses. Many, it says, will enter that, that wide gate. That so many people will take that easy path that ends in destruction, mm-hmm. and few will find the narrow gate, the hard way, which, which culminates in everlasting life. So that means if you choose the narrow gate, if you find that narrow gate, you will not be the majority of people. Mm-hmm. And this is to be expected. And because of that, I think we can assume, hey, this, this hard way, it's going to seem maybe lonely at, at times, or there, there's just not going to be as much support as you might find, it, theoretically, in a group of the many who are going in another direction. And as we tell people, as a, as a Christian, as one who's on this hard path that's, that's taken the narrow gate, I can't be surprised that we find out that many don't take it. Because Jesus has told us here, many don't take it. We talked about it a little bit when we were going through um, the book of Peter, First um, Peter 
that sometimes in our flesh, um, as we're going about life as a Christian, it sometimes feels like we're doing the wrong thing. And what Jesus is saying is, no, the way is hard. Expect a hard way. Many will not find it. Expect that. Expect to be in the few. But this is the path that leads to life, so expect that as well. So um, just to kind of wrap up this little section, I, the gate is, for those who will find it, 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 it's ever before you. You can, you can choose to take this narrow gate, but at some point that time, that entrance into the gate is cut off. Like there's, um, there, there's a similar uh, um, a teaching of Jesus that Luke tells that may be parallel to this. It may, it may be just a little, another teaching of Jesus at a different time. Not exactly sure, but it talks about a door and how the door is closed. Like there's a time when entrance into this way, entrance into the way of the kingdom is closed. That time is, is death. I mean, for, for it's either death or it's when Jesus returns like he's promised to return. And both of those things, we're not exactly sure when that's going to happen. I have a little... Um, uh, a little saying that's taped to my nightstand in the morning that says, uh, "Today may be your last." Just to like remind myself when I when I'm as I'm living today, I want to make sure that I understand I'm not guaranteed to have the next day, um, and so we, we don't know when when the cutoff point is for us for our own opportunity to take that narrow gate. Um, but there's only there's only two gates. There's only two ways. There's only two destinations. It's 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 cut and dry. This is what this is what Jesus is saying. It's one option or the other. So just like take a, an examination of yourself and say, hey, am I on the path that that everybody else is taking? That's easy, which is the path to destruction. And if that's the case, then I would say, like Jesus has said and John has said earlier, repent, change your mind, and follow Jesus to the way of life instead. Or maybe you're on the path. Um, that leads to life and I would say expect difficulty and hardship and affliction for a time and being in the minority of people who have chosen that way um, but live in hope of the future let's move on so uh, somebody read the next few verses verse 15 through 20 beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from fruit thistles? So every healthy healthy tree bears good fruit, fruit um, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear good, bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize their, them by their fruit. Okay, so Jesus starts there saying, beware of false prophets. Prophet is uh, someone who is claiming to be speaking on behalf of God. And so false prophet is somebody who's claiming that, but they're not actually speaking on behalf of God. Um, there, are, I think, maybe a similarity for some of us. There are people who go by the, the name of Christian or even talk as Christians and say, well, this is what God says and say all sorts of things on behalf of God who we need to like figure out, are they really saying what's on, what's on behalf of God? Well, how do we know? How do we know if we can trust what a person is saying in that situation? How do we know that the, that the words that they're saying are from God or not, or that they're accurately interpreting even what scripture says or not? Well, one of those ways that we can know is to look to God's word and compare it to that. But, a, but another test of the genuineness of what somebody is saying is to look at their life. It says you will recognize them by their fruits. So if they're a healthy tree, it says they're going to bear good fruit. If they're a diseased tree, they're going to bear bad fruit, or rotten fruit. But your fruit will eventually expose you, whether you're a healthy tree or you're a diseased tree. Now, again, in this illustration, just like the last one, there's warning that comes along with this. Remember, the warning in the last one was if you take the wide gate, the, the easy way, it leads to destruction. The warning here is what? If, you, if you're the tree that doesn't bear good fruit, what's, what's the result of warning? What happens? Verse 19. Yeah, thrown into the fire. Yeah, cut down and thrown into the fire. Again, another kind of just parallel or synonymous way of 
of saying you're, you're spending eternity apart from God uh, in, in judgment. Now, this is this isn't a small thing. Like, are, are they? Is that tree or that person cut down and tossed into the fire um, because of their bad fruit itself? I would say no. It's not because of their bad fruit. The bad fruit is showing the the health or not health of the tree. Otherwise, you could just take all the fruit off of it and throw the fruit into the fire. But he says. Um, in verse 19, it's the whole tree. It's the tree that was the problem. It wasn't the fruit just as a result of whatever's happening in the health of the tree. So the fruit is showing the genuineness of, of the faith or the heart of the tree. Now, I, I think that there's, there's probably some specific idea that, that Jesus is saying here about that this, this role or this, this false prophet. Uh, there's a lot to that idea. But I think the tree illustration, Jesus uses it in a couple of different ways in other places, is, is relevant and applicable to everybody. If you look at anybody's life, you can look at your own life, and you can see, if you look at the fruit, to some extent it's proving what, what your life is actually built on, or what the trunk, is, or what your roots are drawing nourishment from. It's coming out in the fruit. And if, you're, like, if your life doesn't match what you're preaching, then I think what he's saying here, to go back to one of his smaller analogies in here, you're only pretending to be part of the flock and really you're a wolf. So there's, again, there's, a, there's two options. There's a good tree with healthy fruit and there's a bad tree. And the tree that, the, I think the evaluation is, am I the tree or, or, or have a, do I see other people who are a tree who talk a lot about God and say, this is what God says, and this is, um, I, I, I understand what a life in Christ is supposed to be, but the fruit in their life isn't showing what Jesus has been talking about the fruit of their life is supposed to look like, what we've looked about in the rest, what we've looked at in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. Or are you the tree that can't help but to produce good fruit because you're, you're drawing your nourishment from the words of the Lord? Because I think you guys know, like I do, like some people can can talk really well and can be really convincing about, well, here's what the truth is, and this is what God says, and can even twist and contort things. Um, but you may know those people who it's like, yeah, but your life, it, it, it doesn't compare to what Jesus says our life is supposed to look like. Forget about what your words are saying. Like, what is your life proving that what you're saying can be trusted or not? As I was looking at this, I was wondering, does does the wolf, like the wolf in, in sheep's clothing, does it does he know that or she know that he or she is a, a wolf? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if like if this if a false prophet um, is always knows always has malicious intent in that. Maybe maybe they do sometimes and they don't sometimes. But basically, this is. Um, the next illustration we'll move into makes it clear that some people go through life thinking that you're good, thinking that you will enter the kingdom. And this is where I really especially would ask us to just look and evaluate our own lives, thinking that we would be a part of the kingdom. And Jesus says some of those people, in fact, even says many of those people are not. And so, again, as we like look through this next section, just... I examine yourself to see, hey, it, it, it is, is my life consistent with what Jesus is saying here, that I would enter the kingdom of heaven, or is it not? So if somebody could read um, uh, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? and cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you, work, you workers of lawlessness. So I don't know about you all, but this is, it's a little bit puzzling to me, like the, the order of these um, illustrations. Um, because these are people that, that Jesus is saying, like this isn't even a, a tree or a wolf or a gate or any of this stuff, but this is an actual person, or a, a, he's illustrating with a person, who not only say 
that they are on God's side, like maybe a false prophet would say, but they even do some amazing things in his name, it seems. Um, so there's some seemingly good fruit. Like you could say, well, these are people who they actually, like there's some fruit in their life that maybe isn't, isn't that proving that, they're, that their faith is genuine, that they're a good tree. And so it's, it, it, we were saying, hey, it's not just, it's not just talk, but our, our life has to match up for that. It's not just, hey, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the Lord. No, but we need the good fruits to, to back up what you say, to know that what you say is true and that you're not a false prophet. And, but we're seeing here, well, this person has talk. They're doing things in Jesus' name. It says, in, in your name, in your name, in your name, three times. And they have the fruit. So I think, like, what's going on here? I think, man, I need to think this through. Because I think, man, there's some good things I think that, that God has done in my life, some good deeds that I've done. I'd like to think that I'm a good tree. And, well, wait a second. I don't want Jesus to, to say to me, well, hey, depart from me. I never knew you. So I ask you guys, I'll ask you this question, like, how then, like, according to these couple of verses here, how then does one enter the kingdom? And I'll, I'll I want to ask that, like, um, Jesus is teaching this before he went to the cross and was resurrected. We know a, a, a critical piece of information, um, and it's, it's our belief in his, his death and resurrection, what that accomplished, that's critical to our salvation. These people at the time, what, what does Jesus say here to the people listening on this hill? Like, what, what is it that, um, that is going to, or that is somehow related to their entrance into the kingdom or not? If it's not just the crazy works that they've done and the things that they've said, what is it? Personal belief. Okay. Do you see anything... Like specifically in the what's the question again? Um, how is Jesus saying one would enter the kingdom? Oh, is it to do the will of the Father who is in heaven? Entering in at the narrow gate. Entering the narrow gate, and specifically, like here in verse twenty-one. Who, who's the one that enters the kingdom of heaven? The one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Like that's that's at least the, the simplicity of the answer that he gives here. So entering the kingdom, at least to some extent, has to do with doing the will of the Father. Now don't um, freak out on me because I'm not going to like teach a works-based salvation. But but John agrees with this idea uh, in 1 John 2.17. says, The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides, for, abides forever. So... Like, what is that will of the Father? How can we do the will of the Father? Well, if you go to the, I mean, not to go to other um, books too often, but mm -hmm. in John 6, it says that, somewhere in that chapter, it says that the will of God is to believe in the one he has sent, to believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So God's will is for us to believe in Jesus yeah. and to, have to believe in all that he did and said he was. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And so in that, this is just a devil's advocate, in that belief, you said mm -hmm. something along the lines a minute ago about <coughs> a key part of our salvation is, or our entrance into heaven is knowing Jesus and knowing the basis of the resurrection and everything. But many people do know mm -hmm. that and, or, and, you know, know that. Yeah. So in terms of our belief, um, <coughs> how deep is that? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So what you're saying is like even the demons believe that Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah, that kind of thing. And even lots of non-believers believe and, you know, know the steps of, okay. the, yeah. you said know the importance of the resurrection. Like they can spell out the entire. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I, I think a, I'm trying to decide if. Well, there's a, there's, there seems to be a little difference between believing, yeah, that's true. That yeah. When he says believe on, you know, like trust in. You know, like there's a trusting in Jesus yeah. too, yeah. where it's not only do I believe it's true, but I, I I throw myself onto that belief and trust that belief yeah. in Jesus. Yeah. I, um, yeah. I think there's, there's a little difference there. Certainly, yeah. yeah. It's like that faith that leads to obedience. Like I believe it so much that it leads me. To like where they were at this point in time to follow him, mm -hmm. um, like it's really me. 
to a following of him, which is obedience. It's a belief that's so strong or, or so real that it, it's leading to submission to what Jesus yeah. says or who he is, mm -hmm. right? It's not just a, okay, I believe that, but screw you, Jesus. But it's, it's no, that I'm, I'm surrendering my life to that or I'm trusting Jesus. Um, and I would, I would argue, or not argue, but I would say that, like, kind of in the context of here on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying to some extent what the will of the Father is in some of the previous passages, that the will of the Father is not just that we do the right things, but that the will of the Father, Jesus' will for us, and his words, what he's commanding of us, is, is a right heart. It's not just the, the religion of what we do. Um, it, he remember he said you need to have a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees. It's mm -hmm. it's our actions and what's going on in our heart. It's not just external like this like this person in the illustration. It's not just this ostentatious display of well look at all the works that I've done. But it matters what's going on in the heart. There it doesn't it doesn't just matter how how perfectly you behave. We've said numerous times the past six weeks like the heart the heart the heart like Jesus is caring about what's going on in the heart and the, the actions that we have are, are just outflowing of what's going on in our heart. And what we do in secret is showing evidence of what's going on in our heart and what we, how we think about worldly possessions and if we're anxious or not. Like These things show just what's going on in our heart. And Jesus has showed, he's, he's shown the, what kind of the in, intent of the law was and he's saying if you miss the, my, the heart behind the Old Covenant law, I don't, don't want to get into too much detail here, but um, regardless of how you live and how well you can keep that law, which by the way, you can't do it, but he, he's calling them still workers of lawlessness. The, the works, the display that you've put on isn't good enough. We shouldn't write off too quickly that there are many that will say this, Lord, Lord, look at all that we've done. And he's going to say, I never knew you depart from me. Um, and I think that the will of the Father that he's talking about that, that is, is related to this entrance into the kingdom of heaven, it's, it's what he's been describing in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the Beatitudes. It's those who are meek. It's the peacemaker. It's those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the light in the world. It's those that don't just, they're not living under the letter of the law only, but they're living under the intent of the law. So it's not just the physical things that happen, but also what's going on in our, in our heart. Um, it's those that their secret life is, is consistent with what they say to believe. It's those who are concerned not just about temporal treasures, but eternal treasures. It's those who are in peace, at peace in life, trusting God and not continually anxious. So I'd say, if, do, do those things, do those, the, the type of life, the kingdom living that he's describing here, does that characterize your life? Are you headed in the direction of the Father's character? Now, we're not going to be perfect. Like we're, we can't operate perfectly in these things. But these are, these are fruits. This is a way of living that's exposing our heart. And I think, hey, we, need, we just need to, we need to examine ourselves. I don't want anybody to be fooled into thinking that's a part of this church. And as there's, as there's more people that, that come in and hear our conversations and everything, I don't want anybody to be fooled to think that, well, if you just do the right things, then you're going to be granted entrance into the kingdom of heaven because Jesus is saying it's so much more than that. It's not about the display of what you can do, what you can muster up, but it's what's going on in your heart. Another uh, really important point here, I think, is that it, this, is, this is Jesus talking, right, when he says, not everyone who says to me, mm -hmm. and he says, um, and, and I will declare to them, I never knew you depart. Like this tells us something about Jesus that maybe hasn't been as perfectly clear yet in Matthew, but this is Jesus speaking. This is Jesus making the call on granting the right to the entrance into his kingdom. Uh, this is Jesus like making judgment of um, of those who will enter the kingdom and those who will not enter the kingdom. Um, as we've studied in Matthew, we've seen several things. We've learned several things about Jesus. We've seen that he's, he's this promised king. He's this promised Messiah. He's God with us. Um, and we're seeing now Jesus is involved he, as, as a judge. Like he's, he's the one that is, is, it, it is responsible and has the authority to say the rules for the kingdom of heaven, so to speak.
And that's a really like important thing that we understand about who Jesus is. And it comes up even in, um, as we look on to the, the next little section. Verse 24 to 27 says this. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Now, Palestine, a super dry area and the fall rains, would, like a flash flood almost would come and there'd be these huge like rivers and torrents that would like just wipe out everything in their way. So this was like a... a understandable, like great illustration for Jesus to use, especially to the original hearers. But he says, everyone who hears these words of mine, again, this is Jesus' claim to, hey, this is, this is what I'm saying, and this is what carries authority. Everyone who hears what I say and it says and does it, you're like a wise man built on a solid foundation, able to withstand. If you hear what I say and you don't do it, it's like a foolish man built on an uncertain sound foundation that's going to get carried away with the flood. So again, I think like going back to the last illustration, doing the will of the Father is almost synonymous with doing what, what Jesus is calling you to do. Like understanding and believing and trusting Jesus' words, it seems that he's saying here. And the words, I think even specifically that he's saying in, in this particular uh, teaching. Interestingly, these two houses that are being built it doesn't say anything in this passage about the, the quality of the house or what the house actually looks like. And I don't know about you guys, but like I know a lot of people, Christians, non-Christians, who have like a lot of good works and they've kind of built a lot of like good good things in this earth, not physical houses, but they've but they've done like a lot of good things. And like if you just compare the two, it seems like, well, this person has a they they their their life has built a pretty good house and this person's life has built a pretty good house. And something we may not even know just by what that house looks like, uh, what the condition of the foundation is. We we might not know that, mm -hmm. and it, it takes sometimes a flood to wipe through. Um, and I think specifically, this is talking about the flood of the judgment of God. But you you might even know somebody who um, seems to be just this really good person who's done a lot of good works and and it's a built a good house, so to speak. And, and then when even a tragedy in this life comes, their, their world completely crumbles, and to some extent it shows the condition of their foundation. Now I'm not saying, like, even for a Christian and, and, and in our world, certainly there's things that crumble down when tragedy strikes. But for a non I don't know if you've ever seen somebody who, who, who doesn't actually believe in the Lord, isn't following Jesus, and when that thing comes, I mean, their, their whole life is, is over, is, is screwed, because they're their foundation was shaky. They had no certainty in that. Um, what holds up in the kingdom of heaven is the homes that are built on the rock, which I would say here, this, the, the rock is following, believing, trusting the words of Jesus. And again, all this teaching is before the cross happens, and like there's some additional very uh, important information that comes then. But what, what Jesus is teaching is that we have to learn to believe and trust in what Jesus specifically says. And it's, it's what Jesus says that matters in our belief in that. So um, just to wrap this up, um, we've spent two and a half chapters kind of saying, here's what it looks like to live in light of the kingdom of heaven. We've keep, kind of said some similar things. And Jesus ends this sermon with some really blunt statements, like many will take this easy way that leads to destruction. Some people, like they sound like they're, they're, they're talking like they're about God and they're for him, but their fruit shows differently and they're going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. Some people do some really big things, even in the name of Jesus, and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Some people's houses, though they may even look good, I don't know, but they're going to be washed away in the flood of his judgment. So do you guys see why at the beginning I was saying, I think this is a, this is a passage for, for us as believers, the church, to, to think very um, gravely about, or very, like, 
deeply about, and I would say even for, for all of us to just take a minute and say, hey, let's, I, just like Paul tells the Corinthians, and maybe or maybe not this is the passage of what Jesus was telling the disciples, but hey, you know, examine yourself. Is your, is your life about your own, what you've done or what you've said, or is your life about the will of Jesus, which he's concerned about our heart and becoming more like we've said the character of the Father? And so you may be thinking, hey, I've never even, um, I've never even walked through that narrow gate, or I've never even decided to land on that hard path that leads to life, and I'm just following the majority of the people along with everything else that they do. And if that's the case, I would say repent. Like, change your mind and follow Jesus, because Jesus, God, the authority is saying one way leads to destruction, one way leads to life. Mm -hmm. And some of us have... have some Christians have felt pretty confident that they're doing the right thing. I say, some people claiming to be Christians have said, you know what, I think I'm doing the right thing. I think I'm living life uh, correctly. I think I'm on this hard way that leads to life. But you need to take a good hard look at the fruit in their life. If it's matching up the type of life that Jesus says is, is his will and is the will of the Father, some people need to consider, hey, what's the purpose? What's the motivation behind these works? Like, is it, is it just to kind of to be religious and do the right thing in the eyes of people? Or is it actually because my heart has been changed and I, I trust what Jesus says is correct and worth following? And uh, is maybe some people, some people who believe, have believed that they've been Christians they kind of compare to everybody else's houses and they say, well, my works kind of look about like the next person's work, so I'm going to be okay, only to find out that there's, um, there's a, a flood that's going to come and it's going to reveal what they've based their uh, beliefs on. So the, the passage ends just um, with Jesus saying not an unimportant thing, or Matthew saying this, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Jesus was teaching with authority. Jesus doesn't just have nice things to say to make people become nicer. Um, one commentator I read said, the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount is not meant to be admired, but to be obeyed. And Jesus is giving some clear warning about those who would make the wrong choice. And another commentator said, such preaching, this preaching of Jesus, reflects either one, the height of presumption and heresy, or the fact that he was a true spokesman for God whom we dare not ignore. So Jesus is like, he sets before us two options. There, there's, there's a wide gate. This is the options for, for anybody. There's this wide gate. Many are going to take it. There's a narrow gate that few are going to take. There's an easy path. Many are going to take it. There's a hard path that few are going to take. There's bad tree with bad fruit. There's good tree with good fruit. There's counting on your own works and what you can muster up or counting on the, the good works and, and trusting in what Jesus calls us to. There's a house that's built on, a, on the sand. There's a house that's built on the rock of Jesus. And there's only those this two options. And... Um, Let me just let me end in prayer. Father, would you would you help us to understand the, gra the gravity of um, of what you teach, not only about this life, but uh, what comes after this life? Mm -hmm. And we forget that. I forget that often, Lord. And um, it my life changes when I consider um, the life to come, the hope that I have and the hope that those who don't know you don't have. So would you help us to live appropriately in light of those things? Mm -hmm.